So in the last video, uh, we looked at an intuitive analysis of whether it was legal to reverse a loop nest and decided whether or not that program transformation was legal. Um, it, now we're going to formalize that analysis a little bit more, and in the process we're going to get some intuition about how the polyhedral model is used to check the legality of program transformations. So let's just remember our original program, which is uh, just this loop nest for i in 1 to 4. We execute the statement s, which uh, does a sub i equals a sub i minus 1. And we're given a candidate target program, which is this program, except the for loop around the statement s has been reversed. So both of these uh, define the same set of statements, and we can represent the set of statements in the program in three different ways. We can think of it as, you know, this list of statements, S1, S2, S3, S4, or S1, S2, S3, S4. We can think of it as the set of four points, one, two, three, four on a number line. Or we can write it in set notation as the set of all statements SI, where I is between one and four. And the set of statements is exactly the same for these two programs. It's just that the for loops define different traces over them. So, as I just said, the control logic divides the order in which these statements are executed. And in the polyhedral model, we would call the order in which the statements are executed the schedule. So, we can represent the schedule as a map from statements to the times when they happen. So, here highlighted in red, we have the schedule for the original program, which says that statement SI happens at time I. And if you look at this program trace with time going downward, S1 happens at time 1, S2 at time 2, S3 at time 3, S4 at time 4. Then if you look at the modified or reverse loop nest, SI happens at time 5 minus I. So for example, S1 happens at time 5 minus 1, which is 4. And if we see time 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, we have S1, and then S2 happens at time 5 minus 2, which is 3, and 1, 2, 3, and here's S2. So the control logic defines the order in which the statements are executed, and in the polyhedral model, we capture that using a schedule that maps elements of the set of statements, or the iteration domain, to the times when they're executed. Now, to check the legality of the program, we have to have some notion of what makes um, a transformation legal. And so the schedule and the memory access pattern of the application together define a set of data dependencies. So the data dependencies are going to be a set of pairs of statements. And they're going to be the set of all pairs of statements where the statement on the left-hand side of the pair sends data to the statement on the right-hand side of the pair. So for example, in... Uh, this uh, this function, we can see that we have, you know, a sub i equals a sub i minus 1. So that means that statement 1, uh, or yeah, statement 1, sorry, writes a1, and then statement 2, excuse me, reads location a2 minus 1, which is 1. So statement 1 sends data to statement 2. And so we would have an entry, well, the entries in the data dependencies would be in the pairs si and si plus 1 for i between 1 and 3. So if you remember, this matches with the arrows we drew in the last video, right? That s1 sends data to s2, s2 to s3, s3 to s4. Now, if you're being very technical and nitpicky, actually the data dependencies are the transitive closure um, of all of these uh, in this case, because s1 technically sends data to 2, 3, and 4 because it sends data to s2 and then s2 to s3, but uh, this is good enough for now. Now, the new schedule is going to be legal if it respects all of these data dependencies. Another way to say this is that the new schedule is going to be legal, this guy on the right is going to be legal, if the set of all violated data dependencies is empty. Um, and so we need to check whether or not the set of all violated data dependencies has anything in it. So what is the set of all violated data dependencies in the new schedule? Well, it's, the set of, it's going to be a set of pairs of statements because it's a subset of the set of data dependencies. And it's the set of all pairs of statements A and B, where statement A sends data to statement B, but A comes after B in the new schedule, right? So if A sends data to B, then A and B is in the set of data dependencies. And if A comes after B in the new schedule, that means that the new schedule is causally inconsistent, right? There's something that should be sending data to something else happening uh, after the thing that it's supposed to send data to. So we can represent this mathematically as the intersection of one and two. So let's compute the intersection of these two sets. Well, the set of all pairs of statements uh, where A sends data to B uh, is what we just saw on the previous slide. 
And then the set of pairs of statements where one guy comes after the other, or where the guy on the left comes after the guy on the right, is the set of all pairs SI and, of statements SI and SJ, where in the new schedule, uh, the time, the execution time of I is greater than or equal to the new schedule execution time of J. So basically, I happens after J. Uh, oops. And when we intersect these, we get the following, right? The set of violated dependencies is the, is the set of all statement pairs SI and SI plus 1 for I and 1 to 3, where the new schedule of I is greater than or equal to I plus 1. Now, if you remember, the new schedule is 5 minus uh, I, so we can actually simplify this to the following, the set SI, SI plus 1 for I and 1 to 3, where 5 minus I is greater than or equal to 5 minus I plus 1, just substituting in the definition of the new schedule in the reverse loop nest. So this check can be done with something called integer linear programming. Basically, if you think about the definition of this set, this set is empty if and only if the set of equations that define the constraints and the values of i are unsatisfiable. So it's true, or so it's empty, if and only if this system of linear inequalities has no solution. You know, one i is between 1 and 3, and 5 minus i is greater than or equal to 5 minus i plus 1. Unfortunately, if we just substitute in 1, we see that 1 is between 1 and 3, and this uh, simplifies out to... 1 is between 1 and 3, which is true, and 4 is greater than or equal to 3, which is true, <coughs> which means that at least one solution, <coughs> excuse me, exists uh, for i equals 1, and in fact, that was the violated dependency we looked at in the last video. So this transformation actually violates a data dependency in the program, and therefore, uh, it is not legal. So in the next video, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, formalizing this process of constructing sets of dependencies and checking whether or not they're empty using uh, tools from mathematical software. That should be fun, and I'll see you in the next video.